Hello, my name is Shavise Turner, and I am the founder, president, and CEO of the Binge Eating Disorder Association. And I am here with uh, Dr. Rebecca Pohl, who is the deputy director of the Rudd Center. And today we are talking about weight stigma. Welcome, Rebecca. Thanks so much for having me. Sure. Um, could you give us a little bit of information about your work, your current work, and, and your past work around weight stigma and, and sort of how you came to this line of work? Sure. Um, you know, at the Rudd Center, one of our major missions is to address uh, weight stigma and weight bias. And we've been studying this in a number of different ways. We look at this situation for children. So we look at weight-based bullying and how this affects youth and adolescents. Uh, we look at weight bias in the media and how that affects public attitudes. Uh, we look at weight bias in all sorts of different settings, such as healthcare, education, uh, employment, and the impact that this has on emotional and physical health for individuals who are targeted. And we're also doing a lot of work on uh, research that can inform policies and laws that can specifically um, try to reduce weight discrimination. That's excellent. Um, the collection of, of research that you've amassed over the past decade has really been incredible, or, or maybe even longer than a, a decade. Um, but it has really supported what so many of us who have lived in larger bodies know what we've directly experienced. And so how did you personally come to working in this area? Well, you know, 15 years ago or so when, when I was a graduate student, um, I was offered an opportunity by my mentor, Kelly Brownell, to do some research on weight stigma. And it was an issue that at that time I really wasn't very familiar with it. I didn't know very much about it. But as I started learning about it, um, I realized that this was an issue that was really not getting enough attention, um, especially in research. And it was a topic that really needed to be brought to light if if anything was going to be done about it. Um, and when I when I started graduate school, I didn't know that this was an area that I would then form my career on. Uh, but I just really felt that more work needed to be done and I wanted to do it. That's great. Well, we're very happy you did. Um, so when you began working in the field of uh, eating disorders and obesity and um, the this pretty you pretty much answered this, but it was weight stigma on your radar at all when you were working with with people with eating disorders especially um, and if not um, what sort of brought you to the realization that you know it wasn't just people who were living in larger bodies but many people were struggling with weight stigma that's a great question. Well, you know, early on in my clinical training, I was actually working with many different individuals struggling with eating disorders, anorexia, binge eating, bulimia, and I was struck by just how often stigma uh, was emerging in our discussions about treatment. It was, it was clear that stigma was creating uh, major obstacles in people's ability to um, overcome their eating disorders. It was impairing things like self-esteem and self-worth. It was often reinforcing eating disorder symptoms. And, you know, many of the individuals that I was working with um, were often blaming themselves, internalizing the stigma. So we ended up spending quite a lot of time in treatment talking about adaptive ways to cope with weight stigma and to help overcome those barriers. So, you know, for me, um, clinically, um, there is a very real connection between eating disorders and weight stigma. And I think that those experiences as a clinician informed a lot of the research that I did as well. Right. Yeah, it's something that I think has not been paid attention to within the eating disorders community. And so I'm glad we're beginning to do that. Um, you've looked at the biases in healthcare and how these biases can jeopardize the health of larger individuals. You recently completed a study titled Weight Bias Amongst Profes professional treating eating, Professionals Treating Eating Disorders, Attitudes About Treatment and Perceived Patient Outcomes. The first question is, why did you decide to look at this group in particular 
And then can you provide us with an overview of the findings? Sure. So, you know, back a couple of years ago, um, I was actually giving a talk at Adidas annual conference about weight bias. And during the Q&A that followed that, that talk, a number of people um, started asking questions about weight bias among professionals who treat eating disorders, asking, has this been documented? Do we know if this is a problem? Um, and I would say anecdotally for the past five years or so, I've heard others question that as well. And you know, we certainly know from research that, that weight stigma and bias is present in many different health providers and doctors, nurses, uh, medical students, dietitians, uh, but it really hadn't yet been studied in professionals treating eating disorders. And given the fact that many individuals who struggle with eating disorders also struggle with weight, and given that when people experience weight stigma, they often are at risk for eating disorder symptoms, it means that professionals who are treating individuals with eating disorders are, are working with a population who's very vulnerable to stigma. So that, that means we really need to look at this group. Um, essentially for this study, uh, we conducted an anonymous study with professionals treating eating disorders to really examine what are their attitudes and beliefs about patients who are struggling with their weight, who are at different body sizes. And also we wanted to look at what their perceptions are of weight bias amongst their own colleagues in the field. And so, you know, overall, what we found is that almost all of the professionals, about 88% of them, felt very confident and very prepared to provide quality care and treatment to patients of, of large body sizes. However, the majority of them also said that they heard and witnessed professionals in their field making negative comments about patients with obesity. 42% um, of them uh, believed that professionals in their field often have negative weight-based stereotypes. 35% um, stated that their colleagues are uncomfortable providing treatment for patients with obesity. Um, we also found that just under half, about 49%, believe that patients with obesity lack motivation to improve their diet. And 64% believe that they are non-compliant with treatment. So, you know, what these findings are telling us is that despite feeling prepared and confident to provide quality of care, we're seeing considerable pessimism mm -hmm. about patients with obesity, and most of them are observing weight bias um, amongst their colleagues. Right. So that was something that surprised you, or was there anything that surprised you? I know from my perspective, when I read the study, I was very surprised that the number of clinicians um, who said they had their own biases was very low, but yet they had witnessed many individuals, um, you know, making negative uh, comments, and that it gave me pause to wonder how that is. Well, I think there is reason to pause. Um, you know, we know that this is a form of bias that is common among all healthcare providers, and there's no reason to assume that professionals who treat eating disorders would be immune to this. Um, you know, one of the things that we were surprised with, which we haven't really observed in previous studies when we've done this, is the, the high dropout rate of participants in this study. So what we found is that at a certain point in the study, specifically when participants were being asked about weight bias and about their feelings about patients with obesity, we saw quite a few people drop out of the study. And, and that's not a pattern that we typically see. Mm -hmm. And there could be different reasons for this. It could be um, that they feel uncomfortable responding, that they may feel unwilling to answer questions that might suggest they have bias. Um, it could also be that those who have stronger weight bias are more likely to drop out at that point. Um, but what this, I think, is telling us is that this is another indication that, that we really do need to look at this issue more closely in the eating disorders field. Yeah, I agree. That I thought that was very interesting, the, the amount of, of dropout. Um, so why is it important that we know this about ourselves, about our community? Well, I think in order to really address and reduce weight bias, we need to be aware that it's there and we need to understand that it's a potential problem. Um, you know, I think that when we think about efforts to reduce weight bias, that those really have to start with identifying our own personal attitudes and assumptions about body weight. And, and it can be uncomfortable to do this, but I think that it's helpful to really put this into context and to think about how pervasive and socially acceptable weight bias is in our society. And it, it, 
it's difficult to be immune to that. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to recognize that we are often products of our culture and products of the societal norms that, that we have. And so we need to understand that, to think about where do our assumptions come from and, and to really begin to challenge those. Mm -hmm. I think that um, it was interesting that on the same day or a day later after your study was released, there was a study released in the uh, Journal of Pediatrics showing that a significant number of adolescents who present for eating disorder treatment, nearly half, were formerly classified as overweight or obese. Um, so what role does the evidence show weight stigma plays in, in regard to individuals, um, you know, whether they're children, adolescents, adults, um, ad adopting maladaptive eating mechanisms and coping mechanisms? Well, that's a really, really important issue. And, and, you know, we know from really considerable research now with both children and adults that when they are made to feel stigmatized or teased about their weight, that this really increases their risk for a range of um, maladaptive eating behaviors, uh, whether it's binge eating, uh, chronic dieting, dietary restraint, um, extreme weight loss control practices, um, increased food consumption. These are all uh, common risk factors and, and reactions when people are stigmatized. To give you an example of that, you know, we did a study a few years ago where we surveyed over uh, 2,000 women about their experiences with weight stigma, and we asked them, how do they, how do they cope with these experiences? And you know, women reported a range of different strategies, but one thing that really struck us is that 79% reported that they often cope with stigma by turning to food. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that can help us understand this is that stigma is really a form of stress. And for many people, this is a chronic stressor. This is something that they are experiencing daily. And we know from research in psychology that many people turn to food as a temporary coping mechanism when they experience stress. So it's not surprising that, that we're seeing some of this happen. It's also not surprising that we're seeing people turn to unhealthy um, dieting strategies and eating disorder symptoms um, because of the shame and um, really the, the negative emotional impact and distress that stigma causes. Um, and I think, you know, it's so important in light of this research especially to really highlight the fact that, you know, this is very damaging to health. Mm -hmm. And there is unfortunately a common misperception that somehow stigma, maybe it's not such a bad thing. Maybe it will motivate people to lose weight, provide incentive for weight loss. But we see exactly the opposite is true, that this is really reinforcing um, a lot of unhealthy behaviors, eating disorders, um, you know, emotional distress, even obesity. Now there's, there's recent research suggesting that experiences with weight discrimination is actually predicting obesity and reinforcing weight gain over time. So I think we all just need to get onto the same page to recognize that stigma is extremely harmful to health. Yes. And it, um, as someone who experienced that as a child, I likened it to uh, a trauma. It's a recurring trauma that happens daily, like you said, that, that daily stress, and it really goes to the, the core of, of who you are. Absolutely, absolutely. Right. Um, what would you say to the person who is living in a larger body who may or may not have an eating disorder, and this is the first time that they are hearing any of this, and like many of us, they've internalized it to be, you know, I'm bad, I'm uh, worthless and so forth. What what advice do you have for those people and what advice do you have for eating disorder professionals who are now more than ever seeing people of size because of the the binge eating disorder designation? Um, you know, what what should they be looking at with in their training and, and working with their clients? So why don't we start first with individuals who themselves are, are experiencing this. Um, you know, I think the first thing is to really remind ourselves that weight stigma is a legitimate form of prejudice and that it's not okay to be unfairly treated or disrespected because of your body size. This is no different than stigma based on race or religion or sexual orientation. So we need to make sure that we give it that legitimacy. Um, but because of the culture we live in, we oftentimes have to be our own advocates for this. 
um, so that you know when an experience of stigma occurs instead of blaming oneself or feeling somehow that a person deserves to be treated this way we really have to challenge those thoughts I think one of the most important things that a person can do if they have been stigmatized is to really seek support from somebody that they trust whether it be a friend or a family member or a therapist to really talk through the experience of stigma you know how it has affected them to brainstorm and cope um, how to react if a similar situation arises um, you know it, sometimes people start avoiding activities because they don't want to be stigmatized in that activity so it's making plans for how can they do that how can they be supported in that in that situation and also to brainstorm coping strategies for how to deal with a situation if it happens again you know who are you going to talk to to calling a friend going for a walk um, you know rather than engaging in self-blame or increasing anxiety or turning to food you know what is the coping strategy going to be and kind of like we were talking before you know this is an experience of, of trauma and stress and when people experience stress we need to equip ourselves with effective tools to, to cope with that stress and stigma is, is no different um, now in terms of professionals um, you know, as we've talked about a little bit already, I think we can start by really challenging the weight-based stereotypes that we have, um, looking for examples that really debunk those stereotypes. Um, we can also become really educated about the harmful effects that stigma has um, on the, the lives of our patients and how it can interfere with treatment. Um, but to do things like, you know, protect the therapeutic alliance, I think as professionals, we really need to catch ourselves if we're making judgments about people based on their weight. You know, avoid making assumptions about individuals, um, about their personality, their abilities, their character because of their weight. Um, using sensitive communication is also really key, being aware of how we talk about weight. You know, asking patients, well, well what kind of language would you prefer that we use when we have these discussions? So that patients can feel comfortable and empowered um, and then I think also, you know, we need to make sure that as professionals that we have an accurate understanding of the very complex determinants of body weight, that we don't make assumptions that this is simply an issue of laziness or lack of willpower, which we commonly see. Um, you know, in the study that we just completed that we were talking about with professionals who treat eating disorders, one of the things we found is that those who had stronger levels of weight bias were more likely to believe that obesity is caused by behavioral factors like laziness or lack of willpower or, or overeating mm -hmm. rather than other more complex environmental genetic and biological factors and we know from stigma research that when people are educated about these very complex uh, causes of obesity that that stereotypes tend to get reduced. So this may be another strategy that we really need to make sure um, is implemented in the eating disorders field as well. Yes, and that's exactly why we're here today um, on behalf of Weight Stigma Awareness Week. Um, and finally, I think the, the last question, and this comes from the knowledge that um, what your research has shown is that uh, family is really the number one place where, where people are stigmatized. And in the eating disorder world, we, we see quite a bit of, you know, a child who was overweight as, as a child or an adolescent who was overweight as a child who comes in and is um, suffering from an eating disorder and, or they are still in a larger body, they're either suffering with anorexia or BED or bulimia. Um, you know, what do we say who, to parents who are really concerned about their child's body size and also hold those beliefs about how a person, um, you know, becomes the size they are. That's a, a, such an important issue, and, and you're right that, you know, parents unfortunately are a common source of stigma as well. And when we think about children, that means, you know, where, where do they have a, a safe environment? If it's not at school, they're getting teased there. It, it, you know, it may be at home as well. And so parents absolutely need to be an important part of, of this process and, and also need the same education that we're talking about with eating disorder professionals. I think, you know, oftentimes if we're dealing with a child, it's very important as professionals to engage and bring in the parents with this issue to really explain to parents what impact teasing or judgmental or critical comments have on their child's self-esteem and oftentimes reinforcing the eating disorder problems. Um, I think 
parents need to learn how best to talk about issues with their children. When it comes to weight, you know, the, the conversation actually doesn't need to be about weight at all. It should really be about health. And I think parents have a very important role there to make sure that the conversation is not about achieving a certain number on the scale. It's about promoting family health behaviors that everybody can engage in, uh, regardless of what body size they are. Um, you know, parents, especially mothers, also engage in what's called fat talk. You know, they say, oh, I look so fat in these jeans, or can you believe she's wearing that? Or, you know, that kind of dialogue. Children internalize that as well. And so talking to parents about how they talk about weight in general, whether it's about themselves or others, um, you know, is really important because parents are, are critical models for their children, and we need to make sure that, that they are really supporting and, and empowering their children. Um, to be healthy both emotionally and physically. Yes, exactly. And I know that the Rudd Center has many resources on its website, videos, uh, toolboxes, and uh, all sorts of papers on these exact subjects. So thank you again for your hard work and for taking the time to speak with us. And uh, again, all the best. Thanks. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks.